My name is Rob Walker. Uh, I work with the Northwest Baptist Convention. I am the, oh, what am I? It's, it's a ridiculous title. Um, I'm the evangelism, church health strategist, church planting catalyst for Region 4 of the Northwest Baptist Convention. Um, if you're not aware, Region 4, I say it's kind of the non-skinny jeans part of Oregon. It's like Oregon without the Portland area. Um, and some of you guys are pushing that line here, but that's okay. Um, and, but, but really, I, at the end of the day, I call myself a glorified cheerleader. Uh, that, that's all I do. Is we, we believe that healthy pastors lead healthy churches and healthy churches plant churches. And so we try to encourage pastors and churches to, to grow, uh, to have sustainable health. At the end of the day, and you, and you might know this already, I don't know. Technically, being Southern Baptist, your church is non-denominational. By definition, because we are the Southern Baptist Convention. We are not a denomination of churches. We are a convention of voluntarily cooperative but autonomous churches, knowing that we can work together to further the kingdom much more than we can ever do on our own. And so we partner together for the sake of the gospel. When I think about what we do at the Northwest Baptist Convention, just a little bit of our job and our philosophy of ministry, um, about five, oh goodness, a better dad would know this. Five, six years ago, my daughter got married. Um, and, you know, we, we, I was pastoring Cresswell, New Hope Baptist down there. I've been a pastor. I've only been in this convention gig for like the last couple of years. But um, making that ministry money, I mean, we, we didn't have like a big budget for my daughter's wedding. And we called in all the favors. I mean, we, my wife, she's a baker for an event center down in Cottage Grove. She's done cakes for people for the last 30 years. I mean, we've done marriage counseling, everything. And we called in all the favors. And we had friends and family from all over the country just coming in for my daughter's wedding. And, and it, was a, it was a beautiful event. I mean, we had people that were in charge of decorations, others that did the catering, others that did the cake. And there was like a whole like army of women that were in charge of hair and makeup for my bride and like the bridal party and stuff like that. And I remember on my daughter's wedding day is they're making the final preparations for her to kind of walk, um, walk the aisle, so to speak. I never felt more loved by those people than when they were preparing my daughter for her wedding. When I think about what we do at the Northwest Baptist Convention, we show the Father love by preparing the bride for her wedding day. One day Christ is going to return and, and claim his bride. And it's a privilege. We have no authority over the local church. We exist to serve the local church and prepare her for what, what Christ has for her when he returns uh, as uh, her husband someday. And so when you think about what we do at the convention, that's essentially it. We're, we're just making the bride ready for her wedding day. And it's a privilege that I can come and serve you today and, and share the word with you. Um, you're going to find that, that bridal theme, once you see it in scripture, you can't unsee it. It's everywhere. And, and I'm going to share um, a word with you this morning out of what the Lord's placed on my heart, kind of along those lines. But if I can, let me go ahead and just pray for us, and then we'll get into the word this morning. Father, I thank you for the privilege of gathering here with brothers and sisters. And though we, we might be strangers in this world, because of Christ, we have more in common than we do with our own unbelieving friends and family. And I thank you for the common bond, the common spirit that we have. I thank you for, for the beauty of corporate prayer, uh, the beauty of fellowship and friendship and belonging. And Lord, we, we come to you having, having sung songs designed to honor you, to glorify your son. We now come to the proclamation of your word, and we pray that your spirit teach us bring conviction, rebuke us where necessary, and that us, having heard your word, will be challenged to walk in obedience to its demands. Father, we ask that you speak to us now. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Um, in, in the book of Matthew, chapter 16, we read of this. It's, it's a very interesting encounter that Jesus has, this conversation that Jesus has with his disciples. And at the end of this conversation, he makes a very interesting statement. And I'm going to read, read this for you. It's Matthew 16. We're going to be looking at a lot of verses today. But beginning in verse 13, we read, When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say the Son of Man is? 
And they replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter and on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. Now, there's a good bit of debate throughout church history over whether or not that rock on which Christ is going to build his church is Peter, or if it's on that confession that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God. Now, it's the historical claim of the Catholic church that Peter himself is the rock upon which the church will be built. That's why they lay the claim that Peter is the first pope, and they would train the succession of the popes. They would trace that all the way back to Peter himself. Not being of the Catholic persuasion, I hold to a different interpretation. I believe that the rock that Jesus is referring to is not Peter himself, but that confession of faith in verse 16. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. That understanding leads us to the truth that it's personal faith in Jesus Christ that is the foundational hallmark of every believer. And those that have placed their faith in Christ, as Peter had done, make up what's called the church, the church body. And so in this passage of Scripture, we find the disciples absolutely fully convinced as to who Jesus is. And then based on that reality, Jesus assures them the gates of hell are not going to prevail against them. Now, not to chase a rabbit too far, but the last time I checked, gates are a defensive weapon, not an offensive weapon. And so the implication then is, based on who Jesus is, the Christ, the Son of the living God, the church will go on the offensive and take the ground that's been occupied by the enemy. And we find ourselves here this morning, presumably no less convinced as to who Jesus is. And we then are given the sacred task of making that truth known to an unbelieving world. And I would remind you today that the promises of Christ are just as certain for us now as it was for them. But having said that, it can still be a bit of a grind, can it? Yeah, y'all don't really know a lot of my story, my background, but... Um, the last several years have been some of the most difficult years of my life. And, and it's a much longer story than what we have time here today. But the short version is my wife was diagnosed with a very rare, deadly disease um, right about the same time. Like in, in a matter of days, my son's best friend just tragically died right in front of him. Um, between my wife's disease, her subsequent treatments, the loss of our son's friends. And I'll, and I'll tell you, spoiler alert, my, life, my wife lived. I mean, God miraculously, and I know Baptists don't get to talk about this much. Literally, my wife was dead, and, or not dead, but dying, sick. And then she goes to bed. One day she wakes up completely healed. And the doctor's like, I got nothing. There's no explanation for this. There's nothing for me to treat. Literally, I know, right? Baptists don't get to talk about this enough. But, but God, I mean, took us through that season and then we rolled right into COVID. And y'all, that was hard in a completely different sense. As, as a pastor, I was pastoring down at Crestwell in the time. And, and I got to be honest with you, as a pastor, the challenges we faced during COVID were harder than anything that I had imagined they would be. How do you, how do you shepherd a flock that's been scattered? How do you walk that line between faith and foolishness? How do you honor the governing authorities that God has placed in your life without compromising your duty to God? How do you protect the, feet, the sheep and feed them at the same time? There, there were no easy answers for that. And I'm sure that life hasn't been easy for y'all either. I mean, let's face it, it, it just groceries cost more than they used to. The cost of living, I mean, we're working hard just to stay broke. It's, it's difficult, right? I mean, I'm not the only one, right? Please tell me. Um, but we've all faced challenges in the last several years. I know my story is not unique. We've all faced discouragement. There's, there's probably a lot of times in the last several years, if, if you were honest, boy, sure don't feel like we're storming the gates of hell, Right? 
But this morning, again, I want to encourage you and remind you that in spite of the difficulties that we may face, there are certain realities that remain true nonetheless. The church, y'all, we really just have one job, make disciples. That's it. And in doing that, we're assured victory. We are promised that as we do what Christ has given us to do, that the gates of hell are not going to prevail against his church. Now, like I said, we're going to cover several passages of Scripture this morning, but I want to start out with the beginning of the story of the church. It's the story of, of really, we'll look at the book of Acts, of how the church began, and we're assured that because Jesus is living and active today, still empowering and sending the church, that the story we read about continues through us now. And so if you want to look back to where it all began, we're going to start in Acts chapter 1, and I'm going to just read for us verses 1 through 8. This is Luke who wrote the gospel. This is the second part. It was a two-volume edition there. Um, but, but Luke writes in, in Acts 1.8, In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of about 40 days and spoke to the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And then they gathered around him and they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it's not for you to know the times or the date that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Now, you're probably familiar with verse 8, right? That is the key verse of the book of Acts. In fact, verse 8 serves as an outline of the book of Acts as it tells the story of how through the church, the gospel spread first in Jerusalem, then Judea and Samaria, and then by the end of the book of Acts, we see it going to the ends of the earth. And in that, we find our marching orders, they remain the same. We just have one job, make disciples, be my witnesses. That's called the Great Commission. Now, this morning, I'm going to key in on something else in this passage, not at all minimizing the Great Commission, but there, to me, is a fascinating subtext within the immediate context of the Great Commission. And because we're separated from the culture of the day, I think we fail to grasp the beauty of just what's happening here. And we pick up on this back in verse 6. Then they gathered around him and they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Now, I want you to just place yourself in the position of those disciples for a moment. They're worried. They're afraid. They're uncertain. And they want to know when Christ will return and establish his kingdom. And that's a fair question. Just imagine all that they've been through in the, in the weeks and the months leading up to this. They have been absolutely convinced that Jesus is the Messiah, the promised one, the Holy One of Israel. They have entered into Jerusalem just, just to the, the roar of the crowd, greeting Jesus, Hosanna, right? Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Palm Sunday. That can you imagine the swagger of these guys walking in as Jesus enters Jerusalem and then the height of all of that, just a few days, the same crowd's crying out, crucify him. The emotional highs and lows of that. They have seen their king betrayed by one of their own. Although I would argue Judas gets most oppressed, but every one of these guys failed Jesus in a different way. They've seen him put on trial. They've seen him beaten, tortured, put on a cross, executed cruelly. To go from convinced that he is the Lord of life to putting him in a tomb all in the same week. And then a few days later, 
He's raised out of a borrowed tomb. And we say borrowed because he only needed it for the weekend. And he's raised out of a borrowed tomb. And they become convinced, yes, he is the king. He is the Lord of life. He is the promised one. And then Jesus is like, hey, I'm going to be going to the Father. Y'all stay here. Their question, uh, Lord, <laughs> when you coming back, it's fair. Honestly, it's a question I've asked myself a lot of times as I look at the events in the world around us today and I think about my children and my grandchildren and, and the life, the world they're growing up in. I'm like, Lord, it ain't going to hurt my feelings if you just want to go ahead and return just any day now. I think they've got the same questions. But the response of Jesus, he said to them, it's not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority. And this is what's fascinating to me. And this is why I say, once you begin to see this in scripture, you can't unsee it. But the, the language and the conversation that immediately precede the Great Commission, Jesus here, he is using the cultural imagery of a wedding. And it shouldn't surprise us that Jesus is using wedding terminology as the foundation of the church is being set. Scripture refers to the church on a number of occasions as the bride of Christ. But there's a beauty in this that I want you to catch. Now, <clears throat> according to the wedding custom of that day, when it was time for a young man to get married, he and his father would approach a woman and her father, and they would arrange the terms of a marriage. And once the terms had been agreed upon by the fathers... What would happen? The son, he would take a cup of wine, he would pour out a cup of wine, and he would present the wine to the young woman. And in extending that cup to her, he was in essence saying, this wine represents my blood, my very life, and I offer it to you. And she would have had the choice to decline the drink, thus rejecting the offer of this man's pledge, or she could receive the cup and drink it. And in return, she is essentially saying, I receive your life. I accept the offer of your life and I pledge my life to you in return. <clears throat> Y'all here in, in just a little bit, we're going to share in the Lord's Supper. And if you think about it, that imagery runs incredibly deep at the table of the Lord when Jesus offers that cup to his disciples. Again, that's wedding imagery at that Lord's Supper. He is clarifying the terms by which he's going to be purchasing his bride. He says, this is my blood. This is the bride price that's been agreed upon by my father. Even at that Lord's Supper, that is wedding imagery. But what would have happened then, once that bride had accepted the terms of the arrangement, they would have been considered legally betrothed. And even though they had not yet come together as husband and wife, it would have taken a legal divorce to nullify what was called a covenant agreement. That, by the way, is the relationship status of Joseph and Mary that we read about in the Gospels. They were in that betrothal period where the arrangements and the pledges had been made, but the marriage had not yet been consummated. And so then what would have happened, newly betrothed, the young man would return to his father's home and he would begin to build a house for his bride to be. And, and customarily, he would have built onto his father's home. There, there's an old timey song. Some of you old gray hairs in the room might remember that. I've got a mansion just over the hillside. No, you don't. Literally, nobody in first century Judea would have ever imagined their own mansion up on a hill somewhere. Everybody understood, according to the custom and the imagery of the day, the, the young man would have built onto his father's house, Right? And it's a big, big house with lots and lots of rooms. That's the imagery that's probably technically more theologically correct. But what would have happened? He would have begun to build onto his father's house, preparing additional space for his new family to be. And here's the catch. The groom did not know how long that was going to take. In fact, it wasn't up to him. It was only when the father said that the home has been properly prepared that the man could go and claim his bride. Jesus alludes to this in Matthew 24, 36, about that day or hour nobody knows, not even the angels in heaven or the son, only the father. And so when Jesus tells the disciples that no one knows the appointed time, only the father, he is speaking in the context of wedding imagery. They would have understood this. We miss this today because our cultures are different. 
By the way, this is, this is the exact same cultural context we read about in John 14, 1 through 4. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. And if that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you may be where I am. It's wedding imagery. You see, all along, Jesus has been teaching his disciples that he is going to return for them and that until that time, no matter how difficult things might be, they have a job to do, make disciples. And so it stands to reason that his final words to them before he ascends into heaven would be a reminder of this very truth. It's not for you to know when I'm coming back. Only the Father determines that. But you have a job until I return. Be my witnesses. Share the gospel. Make disciples. And you do it in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. But then he says, but don't worry. You're going to be fine because I will give you the power to complete the task and I will be with you always. And if there was ever any doubt that we in Christ would be victorious, church, rest assured that the exact same power, Paul tells us in Ephesians, that raised Jesus from the grave, that has seated Christ at the right hand of the Father, placing all things under his feet, that is the same power that we are assured of in Acts 1.8. Whew, that's a big deal. But I want you to notice just what Jesus is commanding them to do here and why I believe it's in the context of wedding imagery. I think Jesus is telling them the terms of the marriage have been agreed upon. The dowry has now been paid. I'm going to prepare a home for my new bride and I'm coming back for her. But until then, you guys are responsible for the guest list at my wedding. Ish. It, it, don't follow that too far, it falls apart, but just stay with me for a second. Jesus says, I'm getting ready for my wedding. I'm going to return when the Father says it's time. Until then, you go and you invite everybody to the ceremony. And y'all, this is not the first time that Jesus has used this imagery. Matthew 22, we read, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. I told you, once you see it, it's everywhere. He sent his servants to those who had been invited to the banquet to tell them to come, but they refused to come. Then he sent some more servants, and he said, tell those who have been invited that I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and fattened cattle have been butchered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they paid no attention, or they paid no attention, and went off, one to his field, another to his business. The rest seized his servants and mistreated them and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his army and destroyed those murderers and he burned their city. And then he said to his servants, the wedding banquet is ready, but those I invited did not deserve to come. So go to the street corners and invite to the banquet anyone that you find. And so the servants went out into the streets and gathered all the people they could find, the bad as well as the good, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. I believe that Jesus has been preparing his disciples for this sacred task all along. And Jesus warns them, you're going to invite people to come and they're not going to listen, but invite them anyway. You're going to go back and you're going to tell them how great this wedding will be and they will ignore you, but you still tell them anyway. You're going to go and you're going to invite people to the wedding feast and they will mistreat some of you, abuse some of you. They're even going to kill many of you, but you still invite them. And if the VIPs don't want to come, then you go to everyone else and you invite them in. But your job is to tell them. But don't worry, you're going to receive the power to complete this task and the gates of hell will not prevail against you. Y'all, this is the cultural context of the Great Commission in Acts chapter 1. Jesus, in the founding of the church, is telling his disciples to invite people to be part of the greatest wedding celebration of all times. That's the founding of the church. And so then it it begs a question. If this marks the beginning of the church, the apostles oversee the guest list, and I guess us by extension, 
If the book of Acts marks the beginning, where then does the history of the church end? I believe we read about the end of the church in Revelation chapter 19. In Revelation 19, beginning in verse 5, we read this. <clears throat> then a voice came from the throne saying, Praise our God, all you his servants, you who fear him both great and small. And then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters and like loud peals of thunder shouting, Hallelujah, for our Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory for the wedding of the lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given her to wear. Fine linen stands for the righteous acts of God's holy people. And then the angel said to me, write this. Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. And then he added, these are the true words of God. I want you to catch this. Regardless of the hardship, the difficulties, the uncertainty, the, di the, the discouragement, we are part of this story still. Your job is to be out inviting people to the wedding supper of the Lamb. This is our turn. This is our time. Don't give up. I know that this is rocky soil to cultivate. But we should be encouraged that out of all the people that have ever walked the planet throughout all time, our sovereign, reigning, ruling, all-wise, all-glorious king has chosen us now to invite people to the wedding. It can be easy to feel discouraged or to feel overwhelmed or look at the culture around us and think, man, we are losing this battle. But church, stay the course. Your task, your calling, it's not insignificant. There is a holiness and a sacred beauty to what you have been given to do. Faithfully proclaim the gospel. Inviting people to the wedding supper of the Lamb. You, you might feel tired. You might feel discouraged. You might feel like quitting, but know this, Jesus, our King, is worth it. You know that our Jesus is worthy of the worship of all people. You know that this nation, that all nations can be saved through the power of the gospel. And you know that in truth, it is not a sacrifice of our lives to reach the nations because we gave up our lives the moments we died to self and we trusted in Jesus Christ. And now we are his to do as he pleased. Jesus, and he says, go and make disciples. And you just keep doing it until I come back. But to me, the greatest encouragement, blessed are those that are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. We've been given the sacred task of inviting. Do you get this? The angel says, by the way, these are the true words of God. Are you worried about how people will react when you share with them? The Bible says that you are a blessing to them because they've been invited. Regardless of their response, they are blessed having heard of the glorious gospel made possible through the sacrifice of our King. We are a blessing to the world outside of how they respond. Blessed are those who are invited. And there are times that I get it, the fruit of salvation may seem slow in growing, but we can be confident, y'all, that it is growing. And one day, can you imagine gathered around the table at the marriage celebration of our Lord? And we will look up and we will hear the languages of the nations rejoicing in the banquet hall of heaven. That's enough to make me Baptist thinking about it. But consider this. Right now, literally at this very moment, as our rooms are being prepared, as the banquet is being made ready, the heavenly arena, the Bible says, is already filled with those saints that have gone before us. The, the book of Hebrews chapter 11 talks about that hall of fame of faith, those Old Testament saints that were looking forward to the Messiah in the same way we look back to what Christ has done. 
Hebrews chapter 11 tells the story of Abel that is there already, having offered a better sacrifice, the Bible says, a sacrifice that was offered in faith. And Abel is cheering us on from eternity saying, don't give up. Abraham is there, a man who is willing to leave the comfort of home and follow God's command to go to a country that he did not know. And he's cheering us on, telling us to lay your yes on the altar and don't pick it back up because victory is certain. Enoch is there. He's only known in scripture as a man that walked with God. And he calls out to the church today, walk in the faith that you've been given. Noah, the man who trusted God enough to withstand the ridicule of his neighbors and obey God's command to spend 120 years building a boat on dry land. And he calls out to the church today, remain faithful, stay the course. Moses, who led Israel out of slavery in Egypt, delivered the Ten Commandments, crossed the Red Sea. He's calling out today, don't quit, don't give up. Our God is victorious. Hebrews 11 lists other still, Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, King David, Samuel, the prophets, all of these are already there cheering us on, yelling, screaming, don't give up, keep the faith because the gates of hell don't stand a chance against our God, our King reigns supreme. Whew. And one day, unless the Lord tarries, we'll be there with him telling the next generation to go out and invite everybody that you can find to the wedding supper. But what are we to do now today with this? The good thing about Hebrews chapter 11 is it's followed immediately by Hebrews chapter 12. And we read, since we are surrounded by that great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and throw off the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and not lose heart. Y'all, this is our time to offer everything in the service of our King. This is our time to go out into the darkness of this world and show people the light. This is our time to go out into the highways and the byways and invite everybody that we can find to come and join us at the great wedding celebration. And when we're there, when that great and glorious day finally arrives, at that moment, we will know in full what it means to overcome in power. We will know indeed what it is to overwhelm the gates of hell. As I close this morning, I simply want to ask you, are you going to the wedding supper of the Lamb? I, I don't know you. I don't know your church. You might be all strong believers growing in your faith. You might be a bunch of godless pagans. I don't know. Might be a good mix. But I know this, there's a spot at the table for you. If you've never come to the point in your life where, where you have placed your faith in Jesus Christ, let me invite you to the wedding celebration. If you've already got your spot at the table, if you've already placed your faith in Christ, guess what? You're commanded to invite others. So get to it. But if you don't know if you'll be there, the Bible tells us that today can be a day of salvation for you. The groom pours out the blood. We're going to commemorate this in just a few moments. This blood is my life. The cup extended to you. Receive it and become part of the bride. Or reject it. If you want to know how you can receive the cup, how you can place your faith in Jesus Christ when the service is over, I would be thrilled to have that conversation with you. 
I get it. I'm kind of a stranger, the guy that nobody knows here. That's okay. Literally turn to any believer in this room and say, how can I have my spot at the wedding table? And let them tell you because they got an invitation for you too. Christ offers his life And we are betrothed to him when we receive his life and pledge ours in return. Let me pray for us, and then I believe the praise team is going to come lead us in in a couple of songs, and we're going to share the Lord's Supper. And as those elements come by, I encourage you, consider the reality of the wedding terminology as you take those elements. and say He's paid the price for his bride, and we commemorate this until the Father says it's time. And he returns for us. Let me pray. Father, we thank you for the encouragement that comes from your word. We thank you for the promise that based on the reality of who Jesus is, the Christ, the son of the living God, and we profess that truth today, that the gates of hell will not overcome his church. Let us be about inviting people to the wedding supper. Father, let us be about sharing the good news that we have discovered in Christ, extending that offer, extending that cup, so that as many as possible will hear and be invited to the wedding supper. Father, for those that might be here this morning that don't know if they have a spot at the table, I pray your spirit brings conviction in their life. They see the gravity of their sin against your holy perfection, that they will repent receive the offer of life that comes from Christ, place their faith in him, and be made new, having their spot at the table assured. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen.